And joining us now, David Marples, professor of history at University of Alberta, and we're happy that you made the drive all the way east to Upper Canada. Nice to have you here in our studios. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, this is 25 years later for Chernobyl, and without further ado, Michael, if you would, let's bring this map up and we can remind everybody what part of the world we're talking about. This was, of course, the former Soviet Union when uh, this all happened 25 years ago, and there is or was Chernobyl. Uh, Ukraine, just near the border with Belarus, and we see that 30-kilometer zone with the red dots around it. Tell me more about what that 30-kilometer zone means, if you would, David. Yeah, it's the exclusion zone, uh, 30 kilometers radius around the reactor that was destroyed after the accident, uh, the fourth reactor at the Chernobyl nuclear power station. Um, after the accident, initially a 10 kilometer zone was designated. And what did that mean? No one could live in that area or beyond that? It meant that the population uh, had to be evacuated. They were actually told they were leaving for three days. Hmm. Um, it included 45,000 people in the city of Pripyat, which is where the uh, reactor workers lived with their families, and that's about three kilometers to the north. That was the biggest town. But the majority of them were just farming settlements that had been there for centuries, actually. And when did it become 30 kilometers? It became 30 kilometers about three days after the accident had happened, once the government commission had been established. And uh, they, they decided that 10 kilometers simply wasn't big enough. Hmm. Uh, it's fairly arbitrary, though. We should not presume, I mean, we remember this because we remember this, but we should not presume that everybody knows what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Do you want to remind everybody what happened 25 years ago? Yes, um, 25 years ago, I would perhaps go back even further, the, the Soviet Union had a very ambitious nuclear power program which was centered on the European part of the country and two types of reactors, one of which was converted from the, from the nuclear weapons program and one which is exclusively civilian and was exported. Chernobyl was one of the ones from the nuclear weapons program, it didn't have a proper containment dome and it was called a graphite moderated reactor. And we use graphite in Canada too, as a matter of fact, but we do have containment domes over them. And the Soviet Union had brought this plant into operation without carrying out all the tests that are usually done. And one of these tests was to find out how long uh, a spinning turbine would continue to generate power during a shutdown before the emergency turbines came into operation. Uh, the operation had been tried three times before and it had failed each time because the uh, reactor automatically shut down. That's what's supposed to happen, isn't it? Which is what it's supposed to do. And this time, the two operators who were dealing with the experiment decided to shut them all off to begin with so that the reactor couldn't shut itself down. And this type of reactor became very unstable at low power. Uh, the power was almost down to zero. And in trying to raise it, um, it caused a power surge. And there were two explosions, chemical explosions, blew the top off the reactor and a radioactive plume went about a kilometer up into the air, uh, scattered radioactive debris over a massive area, really. Um, radioactive uh, products included things like iodine, which, was, which went all the way across Belarus, cesium, strontium, both have half-lives of 30 and 29 years, and even things like plutonium, which has a, a, a half-life of 24,000 years. Let me give some more of the statistics here, and this is what the International Atomic Energy Agency has said the official word is on the deaths attributed to Chernobyl. 4,000 in total, they say. Nine children dying of thyroid cancer. 50 emergency workers died of acute radiation syndrome. And then the remaining 3,940 deaths from radiation-induced cancer and leukemia. As I say, these are the official numbers. Do you think they tell the whole story? I don't, and I, I doubted the numbers from the very moment that, that Chernobyl happened and we got some information. Um, just to give one or two examples, um, first of all, the deaths among firemen and first aid workers I think are legitimate, they, that is actually a correct total. We know how many were there at the time, they got massive doses of radiation. Then in the zone itself, cleanup workers who first of all removed graphite from the reactor roof before it was covered up and then went in the 30 kilometer zone and had to decontaminate the topsoil, often getting massive doses of radiation and sometimes without Geiger counters and sometimes without Geiger counters that simply went up to the peak level on the first day, even though some of them stayed there for six months at a time. Um, after a month, military reservists were called up. They came into the zone. Hmm. Their choice was to go to Chernobyl or to go to Afghanistan. Some choice. Um, some choice, and they were called up 
So these people were getting large doses of radiation. It's not even low-level radiation. So this would not have been tracked by the IAEA, and therefore you think other cancers are involved here too? Yes. Um, I mean, altogether, the Ukrainians now say something like 26,000 of their cleanup workers have died. Uh, the Russians say about 18,000 of theirs have died. There's a similar figure in Belarus. Of course, they wouldn't all have died of radiation sickness. Uh, many died of heart attacks. Many died from stress-related illnesses. But nevertheless, they were all in the zone. They were all in the 20s or early 30s absolute most. And you think you can draw a straight line between what they died of and Chernobyl? I think so. Hmm. Um, a lot of predictions were made in the aftermath of the disaster about what health effects would take place decades and decades on. What hasn't happened that people feared might at the time? Well, I would say probably leukemia was the one that was noticed at, after Hiroshima back in 1945 when the Americans dropped the atomic bomb. Um, the incidence of leukemia is higher among the cleanup workers. It's not so much higher among the general population in, in that area, and that's a bit of a surprise. Uh, otherwise, um, I think the results are fairly much as predicted, uh, other than, say, thyroid gland cancer, which struck children. Um, there'd be no examples at all of thyroid gland cancer among children in this region before Chernobyl. Nothing happened until 1989, and then we started to see a rise, uh, sometimes 300, 500, and ultimately more than 1,000 new cases each year. Hmm. Um, rising to about six to 7,000 known cases in these parts of Ukraine and Belarus. So as we start to do the, map, the math here, rather, the International Atomic Energy Agency numbers sound, if I'm hearing you correctly, really low compared to what the total cost has been. They are low, but in terms of thyroid gland cancers, the death toll's not been that high. It's, it's actually the most benign form of cancer one can get, just about. The death toll that I've noted to date is about 34. I mean, it's still considerably more than they said. Um, 19 in Belarus and 15 in, in Ukraine of children who died from thyroid gland cancer. But they've had to be, they had to have surgery and they have to be monitored for the rest of their lives. And we're still finding about 300 new cases each year in each republic. Mm. So it's quite significant. Let's look at some of the social costs here, David, because uh, more than 350,000 people were permanently evacuated. And I want to just sort of break it down by group here if we can. Mm. The impact on younger people that this evacuation had, what would you estimate that to be? Well, for younger people, um, many of them were nuclear plant workers. I mean, some of them got other jobs. The vast majority didn't. Uh, many of them were not only unemployed, but when they moved to their new houses, to the new homes, they were treated more or less like lepers coming from a leper colony. People didn't want anything to do with them. They thought they were infectious and they were going to catch some kind of disease. Just for um, the record, is that possible? No. That's not possible. It's okay. not possible. And at the same time, many of them uh, were getting sick as well. Uh, many of them were unable to deal with the situation. And what the International Atomic Energy Agency has called uh, radiophobia, or fear of radiation, uh, basically permeated entire communities. So if somebody got sick in the family, they just assumed it was from radiation. And they began to panic. They would stop eating food. And, you know, my favorite uh, quote of all from Kiev was that red wine and vodka is the best cure for radiation sickness. Where would that have come from, that idea? I don't know, but um, one scientist said that perhaps if you have one glass of each, it might pre be slightly preventative, but if you have more than that, it has a negative impact. <laughs> okay, five years ago, a National Geographic photographer visited the exclusion zone that we showed off the top there, met with some of the older people, Mm. who have apparently ignored all the warnings. They have returned to live in the contaminated area. And his report suggested that they, quote, prefer to die on their own soil than of a broken heart in anonymous city suburbs. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that sentiment to us? These communities that live around the Chernobyl area um, associate more with their village than they do with their countries. Mm. Um, it's a village life. They live off their land. They've lived there for generations. Even the language one finds in this area, it's, it's neither Russian nor Ukrainian nor Belarusian. It's a kind of patois that's a mixture of both, uh, all, all three. And they can speak to each other in this language, but it's very hard for outsiders to tell exactly what they're saying. And so these people were forced to evacuate, and they came back of their own free will. They are and tied to that land. They're tied to that land. Their average age um, is about 68. 
So for an area where the average lifespan in rural communities is about 50, they're already well beyond their average lifespan. They much prefer to stay there and, and actually probably from their perspective that's the best thing they could do. So you can understand that point of view? I can certainly understand that. What has this done to what you might call normal family life in the area? Well family life was disrupted um, in a number of ways in this entire period. I mean Chernobyl was perhaps the biggest rupture. Moving families around, people had to go and find work in different places. Some of them were even moved to, um, you know, to cities, to apartments when they'd been living in villages. One of the things I noticed in Belarus was a, a, an entire group of evacuees had been moved from Chernobyl and they were living in Minsk in a new complex that had been built especially for them. And oddly enough, in the center where children would normally play, they built little plots of land and they were growing vegetables and they were all sitting around on benches just as they would have done back in their native villages. Hmm. So they kind of created new homes in that way for themselves. But nevertheless, I think the it, it's still a little bit dissettling. And you told, us, you told us earlier that there are people who are going to have to be monitored for the rest of their lives as a result of this. What kind of a psychological impact does that have? It's had a tremendous psychological impact. And for a while they were considered also um, victims of Chernobyl and they were entitled to benefits from the state, uh, which was quite significant for some time. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, Moscow no longer controlled these areas. They became independent republics. And the independent republics both had financial crises, and so the amount of money devoted to Chernobyl was going down and down, and the currencies collapsed as well. So in fact, they were getting virtually nothing, just pennies as Chernobyl victims. Um, this is really what forced people to go back to the land and start living off contaminated products. Let's talk about lessons learned. And I remember mm. at the time, 25 years ago, when Chernobyl exploded, you know, people at Atomic Energy of Canada, people I'm sure at uh, Toshiba Westinghouse, people I'm sure at Arriva in, in France were all asking questions about, you know, what does this mean for, for our product and so on. And I think it was pretty well established at the time that the Chernobyl model was nothing like anything anybody made in the Western world and therefore mm. don't overlearn the lessons. Having said that, Fukushima, we're not that far removed from the disaster in Japan. Mm. And I wonder where, if any, comparisons are worth making between what happened in Japan and what happened 25 years ago in Chernobyl. I think some comparisons are worth making, not in terms of technology. I think the Japanese technology is far superior. I think the Japanese safety techniques are far superior to the Soviet Union in the mid-1980s. However, some things are the same. We've had evacuation, in this case a 20 kilometer zone. Interestingly, the Japanese have told people in zones further than that simply to stay indoors. <laughs> um, you know, it's very arbitrary where a 20 kilometer zone or 21 kilometers, it's not as if radiation will stop at a 20 kilometer border. The Japanese are also, I think in contrast to Chernobyl, trying to find, uh, trying to give out accurate information, to give people information uh, quickly, promptly, and not to sort of try and keep secrets as the Soviet Union did. The Soviets didn't care how accurate their information was. Well, they, uh, I don't think they would have even disclosed anything if the Swedes hadn't alerted the world to the fact there was a major nuclear accident somewhere. That's right, it was the Swedes who sort of the blew Swedes the whistle on this, it. wasn't it? Yeah, and the mm. Soviets never distributed potassium iodide tablets, which would have prevented the uh, thyroid gland cancers. The Japanese did. Mm. So the Japanese have learned these lessons. However, having said that, the Japanese did build a nuclear power station in a major seismic zone. And all odds suggested there would be an, a major earthquake sometime in the near future. The Japanese would no doubt reply, the earthquake didn't destroy the plant. It was the tsunami mm -hmm. that caused all the problems. And in that case, I don't think you can do much about it. You simply cannot predict every possible form of accident at a nuclear power station. The record of nuclear power has been relatively good. I mean, no major accidents for 25 years. But they only report major ones. There's a lot of minor ones taking place, including in Russia, incidentally, where they have a major expansion program in place. So they have major, they have minor accidents happening at Soviet power plants that are nuclear powered right now. There was one a few years ago in the Kursk nuclear plant. Uh, there was a steam explosion there. Radiation went outside the plant. This is a plant that's exactly the same model as Chernobyl. Um, and the same capacity as well. And, and the stations were actually built as twins. So there are accidents that are taking place. But the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, Russia is now desperately dependent on nuclear power for domestic energy production mm -hmm. and also for export. 
for exporting technology and also building nuclear power stations outside the Russian Federation, including incidentally in Ukraine. Well, let me follow up on that because this, of course, took place when it was the Soviet Union. Mm. And it's now, whatever it is, uh, 16 different constituent republics of the old USSR plus Russia. Um, who, who feels 25 years later like it was our fault and we should have done something about it? In other words, is this more a Russian thing or a Ukrainian thing or what? I'm not sure that anyone thinks it was their fault. I mean, there's a tendency to just to blame the Soviet Union. Mm. And therefore, the Russian Federation on this uh, example at least would say we're not the Soviet Union, we do things differently. Nevertheless, the vast majority of nuclear power stations in Russia and Ukraine are Soviet built rather than built by uh, technicians from the Russian Federation. So they don't uh, necessarily feel guilt. They have improved the safety and they have improved the technology and they are working with the International Atomic Energy Agency. But the expansion rate is, is more rapid than any time since the 1980s. Belarus, for example, is building a nuclear power station now based on Russian technology, paradoxically because they don't want to be dependent on Russian oil and gas. Hmm. Uh, Russia's lent them the money, they've lent them the technology, and they're installing the nuclear power plant themselves. So it's an entirely Russian operation, and Russia is building nuclear power, power stations in Ukraine, as they've been doing since the 1970s. They're also building them in Kaliningrad region. Hmm. Even though our designs are totally different, our level of oversight is completely different, our attitude to safety was completely different. Is it fair to say that what happened at Chernobyl 25 years ago did have an impact on Western thinking about nuclear power? Very definitely, very definitely. Anytime there's a major disaster, all nuclear power engineers around the world, all the countries, are forced to rethink their situation and retest the safety of their own reactors. And certainly, we had to do that in Canada with the Candus. Um, which obviously are much safer than, than the station at Chernobyl. Um, but the situation at Chernobyl, I think, was so incredible that you simply couldn't have imagined uh, the stupidity, in a way, not only to operate these kinds of stations, but to actually carry out experiments on them as well. So I think the Western attitude is a little bit smug in some ways, that it couldn't happen to us. But in fact, it already did a couple of times. Uh, Three Mile Island in 1979, which didn't really much get out the containment dome, uh, Sellafield, which was then known as Windscale in the United Kingdom, major disaster in the 1950s, which caused a tremendous rise in leukemias around the English Lake District region. So it's happened quite a bit. And in our last 30 seconds, hmm. what's there now? Right now, there's a, um, the reactor closed down in 2000. There's a shelter or uh, a kind of tombment of the reactor. Um, a new roof is being built. It's supposed to be completed in the next three years. It looks a little bit like the Toronto Sky Dome. It has to be kind of uh, brought in on rails over the top. It's costing $2 billion, which the Ukrainian government does ha doesn't have. A uh, French company is building it. And um, 28 countries have so far given money to Ukraine to help build this thing and to also build a radio, uh, a nuclear waste repository. Are they trying to bring that thing back online? No, they won't bring it back online. So what are they doing with it? Um, they're using it as a low-level depository for nuclear waste from Chernobyl and also from other nuclear power stations. Gotcha. David, appreciate this look at history, a quarter century mm -hmm. after Chernobyl. Thanks so much for coming in tonight. My pleasure.